All right, welcome back to another episode. Ryan and Kevin here with Chaos MMA, and today we have on the head coach of the New England Cartel, Tyson Chartier. Tyson, how you doing, man? I'm good, man. Just got back from uh, Europe last week, so I'm a little jet lagged, but uh, I kept back into the swing of things. Yeah, I saw that on your story. I saw you guys were in Netherlands. Did you guys go on like a vacation <clears throat> after like the fight and everything? No, so uh, Karate Combat was having their season four uh, p- kickoff press conference. Yeah out there and um i uh managed a fighter ross levine that uh fights for them and um we used ross as a main sparring partner for the giga fight and karate combat loved that so after the fight they had reached out and asked if me and calvin wanted to come out and be guests at the uh at the uh, press conference so that was pretty cool oh no that is pretty cool take a nice trip down there and everything i bet and see everything but i just want to talk about the year the late everything happening lately how would you sum it all up with the new england cartel you guys made a bigger name for yourself in the last couple of weeks and recently one of your fighters in calvin he beat giga in a fight not that many people picked him to win so how does this all feel lately feels good man it's uh you know you try not to get too too high you know too low with the lows yeah. but with that comes not trying to get too high with the highs so it's uh, it feels great, you know. I, I feel happy for Calvin that you know he had a long, tough year coming out that loss, and you know, being patient as a fighter is one of the hardest things to do, and uh, just trusting the process. But he did, and he came back and showed everybody, you know, what he, you know, why he took that year off, and and that you know he wasn't done, and that he's still a, a true title contender. No doubt. So before we get into Calvin's most recent fight, after the Max fight, was that the plan the whole time to take around a year off before he got back in the octagon? Yeah, my plan was no contact for six months. He could get back to training after a couple of months, and then we weren't going to do any contact. So he could drill and, and do all that stuff. But we weren't going to do any sort of like live contact for six months. And then we'd have about three months training just to kind of get like back into it and work on things. And then, and then you know, ideally a three-month camp. And, and that's really how it went down is, you know, we did six months where he was in the gym, but he wasn't doing contact. So he was drilling, he was working on different things, but he, there was no contact. And then, um, you know, eased into the next three months and and then really had a 15-week camp for the Giga fight and uh, it couldn't have gone any better, you know. You know, we were looking at possibly fighting in October, but ideally, you know, coming out of that last, you know, the last Max fight, as we were looking like, you know, let's, let's wait another year to fight. And I know Calvin wanted to fight sooner and, um, you know, but you know, we had time on our side. There was no rush to get back in. And we gave some, you know, some time for the division to kind of shake itself out and then see how things are going. Unfortunately, I wish the, you know, wish Max, Max a speedy recovery and whatever he's dealing with. But if he could have just waited one more week to get uh, pull out of that fight, that would have helped us a lot because we'd probably be fighting for a title April night. Yeah. So that that uh, year off for him, how much do you think that helped him? Because, you know, you see some fighters, they'll come back way too early. And it really ruins their career. So how much did that year break help uh, Calvin? Well, I mean, I think in hindsight, we can say it helped because he won. But I mean, if he came back and he lost, people would, you know, then he'd be like, well, I waited around a year for this. It's like, you know, I could have already lost one and then got another win. But, um, you know, hindsight's always going to be twenty twenty. But, you know, you just never know. Like, you, you know, he never got knocked out in the max fight. He, he, you know, he got banged up a little bit. But you know, after a fight like that and, and thinking about how his whole UFC career has gone, where he's just been fight camp to fight camp to fight camp. For three straight years, the guy was in camp. He needed a break. And, uh, you know, Calvin sometimes too tough for his own good. He's not going to ask for a break and he's going to take whatever fight's given to him. So I think it was the right time based on, you know, how that fight went, how his career had gone in the UFC up to that point. It was finally like, okay, we're going to give you a break. And um, it's not something he wanted. And, I think that was, you know, that was kind of my plan and I was hoping it worked out, but I think, you know, you're never going to get less healthy with more time, you know? And so I thought take the cautious approach and whatever the, the UFC and the neurologists and all the doctors are saying, let's just add a little bit of time to it. No, well, no doubt your plan definitely panned out as we all saw and January 15th in the first UFC fight card back, he went out there. People didn't pick him. Like we said before, he put on a dominant performance. Is this how you guys saw the fight playing out leading up during this whole long camp you guys had? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, you win seven fights in a row in the UFC, it's super impressive. So you know you have something. But, you know, I think a couple going into the Cub Swanson fight, I don't know, maybe it was going into the Barboza fight. They'd asked me about, I did a coach's interview for ESPN and they asked me what I thought. And I was like, you know, he's, he's still really untested. You know, Giga, if you look at his UFC career going, 
you know, his record going into the UFC, it was like, he fought like two guys with a winning record. You know, he had a very, very padded record. He was brought up slowly because he's working on his ground game. And then if you really look at his body of work in UFC, although it'd be impressive at seven and zero, you know, he hasn't beat a lot of great guys, you know, he, he beat some tough guys, you know, but, um, you know, the Cub Swanson fight, he caught him early. So you can't, really, you know, it wasn't really a fight. That happens, though. And then the Barboza fight, he definitely beat Barboza. But I remember I was watching that fight with Calvin in Texas. And I was watching that fight. And I was more unimpressed with Barboza that night than I was impressed with with uh, with Giga. I felt like our Barboza just let him off the hook a lot, got him in some bad spots and just didn't capitalize. And I felt myself watching that fight being like, man, like, and I, I mean, I, not even myself, I said it. I was like, dude, if we fight this kid, like, there's some things we can do. And and then we went out and did it, you know? No, you did go out and do that. And leading up all fight week, it was weird because obviously we heard with the news with Volkanovski needing an opponent. And he was just, like, talking like he was next in line, even though he had a main event fight Saturday. And as we all know, in UFC, anything can happen. You're not guaranteed to get a win. But he was talking like he was getting that next shot. Did you guys feel disrespected by that at all? I never feel disrespected. I mean, he's got a team around him that's going to advise him to do certain things. And that's kind of the MO of that team is, you know, the group that's around him, not necessarily his team, but, you know, his management group, they, you know, they're always trying to be loud and, you know, be noisy in the media and stuff. And, and it's worked for a lot of those guys, but you know, that's, that's not our approach. And, you know, there's so many different ways it's going to cap. Our approach is always going to be put your head down, let your fight and do the work, you know, do the talking for you. And, you know, we're not going to ask for anything. We're just going to earn it. And, um, you know, Calvin went out and did that. So that week when, you know, I was doing a few interviews, Calvin was doing a few interviews, we kind of just said, hey, listen, like, cool. Like, you know, I hope he's thinking about Alex because we're only thinking about him. And he's not a, you know, 7-0 and in the UFC. You know, you don't look over a guy like that. You know, he's very, obviously he's very dangerous. He's got an extensive kickboxing background. He has a certain skill set that will ruin you if you don't fight a certain way. And that was our focus was just beating him and letting the cards fall how they fell. But, um, yeah, it was interesting that he was taking that approach because I think I had said it before the fight, it's it's not a good look after the fight if you don't win. And uh, if anything, I think it just adds more pressure to you to go out there and perform. And I think maybe he was kind of falling victim to the recency bias that the media had and all the fans had about Calvin thinking that he'd never be the same and that Calvin is washed up after the Max fight and this and that. But I think you see there's a certain rub when you go out there and, and get beat by Max like that. You know, you look at Ortega, he's never really looked better. You know, he took some time off after the max fight. We kind of did the same thing. So, um, yeah, I and mean, we kind of paid it forward that night. But that that week leading up to it, it was just interesting to see how it was all playing out. And, um, you know, the only focus on what you can control and the only thing we could think about is, is Giga on the 15th. And, you know, clearly he was thinking about other things. And, you know, maybe that played a factor. Maybe it didn't. No, yeah, it was definitely interesting. And I just wanted to ask you one thing about that fight, though. Like, was the re- the wrestling in the first round, that was part, was that like part of the game plan to make Ego aware of the takedown and knowing it's not just going to be a stand up fight? You got to be aware of this wrestling. Yeah, I mean, you see, in any fight that he's gotten taken down, he's barely won. You know, any fight that anybody's able to put their hands on him, lock him, and, and drag him to the canvas, he's winning by split decisions or, you know, he's struggling. And, and then, and even the fights that he has won, other than I'll take the Barbosa a fight out of that. Up until that, even fights that he's won where he's like had to defend a takedown, but didn't really get taken down. Going into the second round, he's tired, you know, and, and, and we noticed that. So we knew if we could just at least have the threat of a takedown in there, it would really neutralize a lot of his striking and make him stress mentally. And then if we got a takedown, we knew he'd be done, you know, and he even told Calvin in the hospital after he's like, yeah, I was zapped after the first round. And that was kind of what we figured, you know, we didn't want to only wrestle like, you know, our plan going in was, you know, threaten the wrestling. So it keeps him honest, but then beat the shit out of him with your hands and you know, obviously pressure forward. And I think everybody's got that clip of me saying, go get in a knife fight and this and that, you know, we kind of use the analogy is he's a long range weapons guy. You know, he wants to stay out at, at kickboxing range and use his sword. And I use the analogy to Calvin. It's like, listen, we don't have a sword in this fight. We have a knife. So we have to go forward and we have to get in a knife fight. Yeah. So another thing I saw in the fight was the beautiful spinning elbows that Calvin was landing. And then on Instagram shortly after, he was like, yeah, we've been working on it the whole camp. So when you're working on those, like, I guess, like special moves that are going to surprise the opponent in camps, like what other things are you trying to work on? Like besides the spinning elbow? No, Calvin's 
if you go back and look at Calvin's UFC debut against Andre Philly, he was winning the whole fight. And I think it was like the third round. He threw like a really bad spinning wheel kick. And it was like, and I yelled out, keep it basic, Calvin. And ever since then, we've had this push pull thing with me, him and Rob of like, they always want to throw spinning everything. I'm like, guys, just keep it basic. Like just keep the basics. And I, I don't, I'm not a, usually a huge fan of the spinning stuff. Um, you know, if you look back on Rob's fight with Ricky Simone, he threw a spinning elbow and barely missed, but Ricky took his back and took him down. And I, I remember during the fight in the corner, I was like, this is horse shit. And Calvin's like, I don't know, man, that's kind of cool. And, um, you know, they just like to freestyle. They like to try that stuff, get creative. And, and Calvin's got a good feel for in the fight when he's, you know, on cruise control and Calvin does things like that. He starts to get reads on guys and, it, it, you know, he's trying to get more creative with his striking and use more elbows and knees and kicks and stuff. So that was something that just came out every now and then in training, but it wasn't something that we were like, Hey, listen, when he rushes us, let's do this. That was, that was all Calvin. You know, you practice what you, you do what you practice and, and in practice, when he starts to feel a guy's doing a certain thing, he'll, that'll come out. And um, usually I'll laugh at him. And then in the fight, it came out, it was beautiful. And I actually said, like, I think it was in between the second and third round. I was like on the stool. I was like, I know you're not going to believe this, but I actually don't mind the spinning stuff right now. And uh, that was probably the first and only time you'll ever hear me say that in a fight. But yeah, it was beautiful the way he, he made that read. And then he found something there and just ran with it. Yeah, so it was an amazing performance by Calvin. We're very excited for his next fight. And looking at the rankings, uh, where do you want to? Who do you want to fight next? And is is Brian care. a fight that interests you at all? I mean, they all interest us. It's like we just want to fight for a title. So I think it just depends. Like, I don't know what's up with Max, but if Max is out for like a year, then I think we're next in line for a title shot. You know, I think you look at Ortega just lost for the title. Um, if if Alex goes and beats Zombie, no, he hasn't earned a rematch with Ortega yet. You know, he has to go and get a, a nice solid win. And then Yair just lost to Max, so he's not going to fight for a title, ideally, coming off a uh, off a loss either. So if April 9th, Zombie and uh, Ortega go out there, I think we get the winner of that fight if Max is still hurt. But if Max is obviously healthy, then he gets the winner of that fight, and then who knows who we fight. Maybe we fight Ortega, maybe we fight... Uh, you know, Yair, Emmett's out there, the loser, the zombie, and, uh, and um, you know, Volkanovski. So who knows? Like, there's a lot of stuff moving around. So that's out of our control. And then the other option would be, like, if someone gets hurt for that April 9th fight, I think we're the obvious fill-in. So I think we just have to, once again, go back to what we always say is focus on what we can control and just get in the gym and, and stay ready for whatever pops up. Yeah. yeah, and you said you'll you'll probably be the fill in, say something happens for that fight, and you have to assume Calvin Calvin's ranked five right now. He wins his next fight. You think that probably puts him in line for the next title shot? I just don't see how it can't, because like I said, you take uh, you take um, sorry, I'll put my phone charger in. You take take Max out of the uh, equation right now, and and I think we're the next in line. You know, you got Ortega and. Um, yeah, year coming off losses and, and zombies fighting for the title. So if Max is in an equation, we're the obvious next in line, in my opinion. But, you know, this is MMA, there's a lot of politics, so who knows. But um, but if Max isn't, then I think whoever we beat next puts us at behind. You know, then Max will fight the winner of Zombie and Volkanovski. And if we go and beat any of these guys around us, I, we're the next guy, you know. So I, I think, you know, we're in a really good spot right now where we can kind of control our own destiny, whether it be – Aside from Max's injury, you know, um, you know, we're either going to get ne the next title shot or win one fight and get a title shot. You know, I've kind of heard the narrative out there with some people saying like, oh, two more wins and he's right back there. And I don't even think it's that. I think we're there right now if Max is still hurt or if Max comes back. I think we're right there with one win. Yeah, well, no doubt. It's going to be interesting in these next few months how this all plays out in this featherweight division. And last thing here, Tyson, thank you for coming on again. Another fighter in the New England cartel, Rob Font. What do you think's next for him? You know, like when do you think we see him back in there? And do you guys have like a, a specific opponent or just like whatever the UFC kind of offers right now? It's whatever, man. Um, I think in like June, July, you know, give uh, you know, that was a tough fight that he just had. So we'll get, uh, you know, he's back in the gym now, but you know, he had the slightly fractured orbit, also we had to rest that, but he's just finally getting back to a little contact training. So, um, yeah, I think June or July is a good time frame, and I think you know it doesn't really matter who we fight. I know a lot of people, I mean, the, the low hanging fruit, when you look at the rankings, it'd be, it makes sense for us and Sanhagen to fight. We're both coming off losses against, you know, the champ and a legend. Um, 
both sitting at what four and five right now. I think it makes sense, but you know, who, who knows what, what'll happen. And, you know, I think Rob matches up good against a lot of these guys that are around us. So it'll be exciting to see whoever gets next. No doubt. No doubt. Well, thank you so much for coming on again. We can't wait to see Calvin and Rob back in the octagon. Tyson, if you want to shout any sponsors or anything, the floor is yours. Oh man. Um, yeah, we get the new cartel.com. We get some new merch up there. So, uh, you know, get the new sweatshirts and stuff, but, don't get fooled. There's a couple fake Instagram accounts that are sending everybody messages right now, trying to get them to click on their link. And I don't know what happened there. So we're dealing with that today, but um, yeah, doing cartel.com, anything that uh, you have for sale, that's cool. And then, you know, just appreciate all the support with everybody and uh, tune in anytime these guys fight. Yeah. We'll, we'll be in that. Uh, you know, the giveaway is Friday, right? Cause we entered in that it's Friday. You're announcing it. Yeah. So just don't let the, yeah. Friday at three, just don't let the, um, uh, there's like a any cartel MMA underscore and then any cartel MA that's messaging people saying they're uh, with the same pictures as us, the same bio that looks the same, sending a message trying to get you to click on the link in their bio for some virus probably. But um, so just watch out for that. But yeah, so hopefully, I mean, hope you guys win. Yeah, that would be nice. But we'll, we'll definitely watch out for those fake accounts too. But thanks again for coming on, man. It was great speaking. We'll, we'll catch up soon. All right, guys. Take it easy. Have a good one. Come on, bye.